so a very good morning friends one topic was long pending and i am with that topic today this is based upon an essay written by lionel mordecai twilling who was born on july 4th 1905 as you know july 4th is an american independence day and 1905 this year you can never forget because of the russian revolution that had begun in the same year as well as the bengal partition in india so he was born on july 4th 1905 and died on november 5th 1975 he has written one very important essay fried and literature i'll come upon that but before that i would like to tell you that this twilling was an american you know literary critic and teacher who brought psychological sociological and philosophical methods and insights into criticism his critical writings include studies of matthew arnold published in 1939 and then em foster is another book which is published in 1943 as well as collection of literary essays which got published uh, the name is the liberal imagination got published in 1950 and then beyond culture essays on literature and learning that is in 1965 the goal of lionel twilling was to educate and stimulate the enlightened middle classes this was his goal and the essay that you have to study in your syllabus that is fried and literature basically deals with the impact of fried and the impact on fried of the previous works as well as the impact of fried in the come because fried undoubtedly sets a benchmark and if we have to divide the entire literature especially in the field of criticism we can divide it separately taking fried as a watermark pre fried and post fried so lionel twilling is also with an essay this essay fried and literature has been divided crystal clear into four parts in part 1 he examines the various influences which conditions fried's theory of psychology and also the great and profound influence which fried has experienced on subsequent writers the impact of the literature before fried upon fried has been studied and then the impact or the influence of Freudian literature on the succeeding literatures this is in part 1 in part 2 lionel twilling has devoted this part 2 to, to consideration of freud's rationalism because it was an allegation of on freud that most of his works are irrational and it deals with the irrational elements in the human consciousness but lionel twilling has countered this point of view in part 2 then comes the part 3 in this part 3 examines the utility and relevance of his psychoanalytic techniques for the study of art particularly literature and part 4 is the concluding part which makes an assessment of his contribution and greatness friends as i said that lionel twilling has divided his essays into four parts i have further divided it the part 1 into two parts that is part 1a where we will see the effect of literature upon fried and in part 1b we will see what fried added now in part 1a the effect of fried upon literature has been no greater than the effect of literature upon fried 
when Leo Lindrilling writes that when his 70th birthday was celebrated, one of the speakers in the meeting described him as a discoverer of the unconscious. But Freud corrected the speaker and stated, the poets and philosophers before me discovered the unconscious. It has already been discovered. What I discovered was the scientific method of, by which the unconscious can be studied. So this is the claim of Sigmund Freud, that I did not discover the unconscious. It has already been discovered by the philosophers and the writers before him. But what I have discovered is the scientific method by which the unconscious can be studied. Then, Lionel Twilling discusses Arthur Schopenhauer and Nietzsche that they anticipated his ideas. But Freud did not read their works as such. But it is nothing but a jet gazed. That is the direction of the thought of that era that there we can find the similarities in the thoughts. And in this connection, Trilling writes that the romantics of the 19th century can be said the precursor of this is this uh, you know psychological studies psychoanalysis is the culmination of the spirit of the romantics the romantics thought that science is standing on the shoulders of literature they believed that literature itself it is scientific search into the self and the romantics believed in the hidden things of the human soul inside the human soul William Blake William Wordsworth Burke did not believe in the wisdom of mere analytical reason the literature of this period is full of psychological insights and passionately devoted to a research into the self. They did it, the romantics. They always delve inside, you know. And while showing the connection between Freud and the romanticist tradition, it is difficult to decide where to begin with. For, for that convenience, Lionel Twining has cited the writer Diderot and he has taken his work Ramos Nephew published in 1762 and Trilling says that many literary critics and philosophers praised this brilliant little work you know, of its peculiar importance. Goethe, Marx, Hegel, Shaw and Freud himself read it, Diderot's work with great pleasure and full agreement. And Trilling draws at the last the comparison and says, to quote, here Remo, this character of Dead Rose character Remo, represents Fried Id, Fried's Id, and Dead Rose represents Fried's ego. So there were some anticipation of these things earlier also. The subconscious or hidden element has always been interest of writers like William Blake or Wordsworth or Burke. For Blake, the dark or the bad was the good. <laughs> For Wordsworth and Burke, what was hidden and unconscious was wisdom and power. So sexual revolution that was being demanded by Shelley by Slegel, later by Ibsen, the belief in the sexual origin of art. It was assumed that art is produced from the womb of sexual powers. Boldly stated by Tieck, more subtly by Schopenhauer, the investigation of sexual maladjustment of Stendhal whose observations on erotic falling seem to us directly Freudian. 
So, friends, we saw the influence of literature on Freud. It is not that the, for the first time sex came into the center. It is not for the first time that Freud brought sex into the center. It was already in the center. Freud started to work under the influence of Jitgis, that is the web of the air, I don't know, but it is somehow where the indication is. Trilling also indicates the same. Now friends, in part 1b, we can see the Freudian influence in literature. So if we were looking for a writer who showed the Freudian influence, Proust would perhaps come to our mind as readily as anyone else. The very title of his novel is in French, which English translation is In Search of Lost Time, or it is also known as Remembrance of Things Past, published in 1913. And if, since it is published in French more than in English, shows a direct influence of Sigmund Freud. To remind you, Sigmund Freud had written his interpretation of dreams in 1900. But Trilling is not sure if Proust had read Freud's interpretation of dreams, but the impact can be sensed. Now even exegesis in T.S. Eliot's poems, remarkably read like the psychoanalytical interpretation of a dream. Yet we know that T.S. Eliot's methods were prepared for him, not by Freud, but even then there is similarity. So we can say that this modern criticism has derived from the Freudian system, much that is of great value, most notably the license and the injection to read the work of literature with a lively sense of its latent, latent and ambiguous meanings. So modern criticism started to take every meaning with all ambiguity because Freud has compelled us to do so. This was Freud who gave us a lens from where we can always delve into more than one meanings as we peel off the onions. So motive of Freud, friends, motive of Freudian interpretation, Twilling writes, is not that of exposing the secret shame of the writer, no. It is not to embarrass the writer or it is not to reveal the secret shame of the writer and limiting the meaning of his work. But on the contrary, that of finding grounds for sympathy with the writer and for increasing the possible significances of his work. So the motive of Freudian interpretation is to find grounds for sympathy with the writer. As for example, Lolita, which is a very controversial novel written by Vladimir Novakov. In that we see that there is a character Humbert Humbert who is absolutely a nymphomaniac. He has everything in him for which he can be hated. But when we read the psychological, Freudian psychological interpretation, we easily understand why has be, has be, his behavior was like that. And instead of venting our anger on him, we went out our sympathy upon him. We pulled down our sympathy on him. He said that since he was 16, his girlfriend died and he is always in want of that spirit in every teenager. That is why I have become neurotic. We become sympathetic toward this character. So to bring this sympathy, finding grounds for sympathy with the writer, and for increasing the possible significances of his work, this, this motive of Freudian interpretation can be felt easily. Now, plenty took inspiration from Freud, undoubtedly. Very few sent him, 
the acknowledgement and gratitude. And it happens. It happens that very few of us give the acknowledgement. It happened with the friar also. But who gave him the acknowledgement? They were Kafka, Thomas Mann, James Joyce. They are, these are some of the names who owed to him. Now friends, in part two, part two of this essay deals with the Freudian rationalism and I have already told you that this segment is written by Lionel Twilling to counter the view and what was the view that he had to counter? The view was then the general general perception was that Freud was concerned only with the irrational elements in the human consciousness. But Lionel Twilling says, no, I have to counter it. And now I have to show how much rational Sigmund Freud was. Twilling speaks about the influence Freud had on literature. Kafka explored Freudian concepts and guilt and punishment. Joyce and Thomas Mann looked at the rational side of Freud who was committed to the night side of life. Mann told to the world this, this is no one none other than Sigmund Freud who walked for the first time in the night side of, of our life which is also 30% of our entire uh, life that we lead. And Freud believed that the aim of psychoanalysis is to consider the night side of life. Because this night side is just like a submerged iceberg where the nine tenth is submerged within the water and which is the day life is just one tenth of the iceberg. You know? And it is to make the ego more independent of the superego to widen its field of vision and so to extend the field of vision and to extend the organization of the id. So friends, now you will ask, I know that you know, but I will tell you a little bit about id, ego, superego. We all are made up of three elements. One is the id, which is governed by the pleasure principle. Our personality is made up of three elements. First one is the id that is governed by the pleasure principle. What is this? Suppose here is an apple. I am sitting in a crowd without offering anyone. I have become so tempted by this apple like an Adam. I ate it. I gobbled it up without asking or without any formality. This is my aid. I was governed by this behavior was governed by the pleasure principle because I tried to get the pleasure of eating an apple and without shame, without fulfilling the basic courtesy. Now what is superego? The apple is with me. It is not purchased by me, but it is there in my room. I know it is not purchased by me. And I, at the same time, I also know that no one is going to eat it because the person who has bought it has left the city. Even then I am not eating. Because if he comes back after three or four days, even if it becomes rotten, if you inquire about an apple and I will say that I have eaten it, I will be embarrassed. So this is called superego. This is governed by the moral principle. My moral is so high that I am not going to touch it. So this is what, but what Sigmund Freud says, that both eat and superego requires a balance and that balancing factor is ego inside us and ego is governed by the reality principle. Then at that condition my wisdom will convince me if I am governed by ego that since apple is there with me now no one is there to eat it is okay that I have not purchased it but if I do not consume it it is going to be rotten anyway I am not going to for the use of anyone. So here what I did I applied my reason. The moment I applied my reason, I am governed by my ego or the reality principle. So this is what Sigmund Freud said. And now I repeat this sentence to quote him. The aim of psychoanalysis is to make the ego 
more independent of the super ego. If the ego is independent of the super ego, will be more rational. And to widen its field of vision and to extend the field of vision and to extend the organization of it. But how to extend the organization of it? Where it was, he says the solution is where the id was, that is where all the irrational, non-logical pleasure seeking dark forces were, there shall ego be. Means ego should never leave the companion of id, otherwise id can be a vagabond, it can be a maverick. So to rein id, to get hold of it, Ego should always extend itself so that there will be always reason walking 24 into 7 hours. So this is how we can organize it. And this is the main purpose of, of this psychoanalytical study. Now, in this we also see that what is the Freudian views upon an art. So this upon art, Freud has two views. One, I won't say black or the dark or the negative. For me, this is the two kinds of views. One is the gray views and another is the brighter views. The gray views upon, uh, upon art that Sigmund Freud believes that art is substitute gratification. That is an illusion in contrast to reality. Sigmund Freud says that art is nothing but a gratification. A satisfaction but that is substitute it is not original so it is in illusion in contrast to reality art is illusion it is not real now in the second gray view that he keeps or the kind of negative we can for your convenience I'll say that art shares the characteristics of the dream whose element of distortion Freud calls a sort of inner dishonesty Sigmund Freud says that art is just like a dream, but it is a distorted dream where artist when, when writes, because dream is, is all free, dream is without boundary. But as a writer, governed by even by the subconscious, when I start to pin down, I just prune it off. So it is a kind of dishonesty. Sapne jase puri nange hote hain. Art bhi sapno ki tarah subconscious कितहतक art and he says that art serves as a na narcotic art a drug ki tarah kaam karta hai and Freud thinks that artist is in the same category as a neurotic jaise neurotic pagal hote hain artist bhi thode pagal hi hote hain this is what he believed now what is the brighter views he has for arts first Freud considered art as one of the charms of life at the same time. And he speaks with admiration about the artists. They don't know what they are Writers understood the motives of men. He says that writers have the special sense of observing the motives of men. And then he says, but unlike other illusions, art is harmless. He believes that how can take a art man who kaha tha ki art illusory illusion pesh karta hai and real nahi hai. But these illusions art illusion of art is harmless and beneficent that it does not seek to be anything but an illusion. Art ka koi dusra purpose nahi hai siwa illusion hone ke. Is mein koi ill motif chipa hua nahi rehta hai. So this is what he opines about art. And then for psychoanalytic practitioner, Sigmund Freud opines that for them there are, we may say, the polar extremes of reality and illusion. Means reality is honorific word and it means what is there. So what is reality? Reality means what is there. 
and illusion is pejorative word and it means response I means a response what is not there so psychoanalytic or uh, psychoanalytic practitioners they do not delve into the world of illusion they delve into the world of reality and artists delve into the world of illusion so the psychoanalysis is after all aimed not at the theoretical refinement but at practical effectiveness the essentially Freudian view assumes that the mind for good as well as bad helps create its reality by selection and evaluation our mind creates by a reality in itself by evaluation in this view reality is malleable and subject to creation reality is not static because it is created by the society at times and because it is malleable so reality is not static but rather a series of situations which are dealt with in their own terms the mind deals with the reality which is quite fixed and static a reality reality that is given and not taken so our human mind conceives the reality of social life and of value so if i say what is real mind deals with the reality which is quite fixed and static see and how this human mind conceives the reality of social life and art value once a woman was supposed to go on a pyre with her husband once the husband is died urko sati ho jana tha otherwise usko immoral bola jata tha this was the reality of the time but this reality of morality got changed with the time and it was considered inhuman aurat vidwa ho gayi dobara shaadi nahi kar sakti hai it was the reality of the time that is why it is said and that is why it is written ki reality is malleable and subject to creation phir unki shaadiyan hone lagi phir naya reality naya moral values unko milne laga so this is what sigmund freud is trying to say that that freud in view assumes that the mind for the good as well as bad helps create its reality reality hota nahi hai aisa usko create kiya jata hai karta kon hai mind aur mind kya hai social mind jo pure mind ek sath kaam kar raha hai wo apne apne reality ko apne apne hisab se banate rehte hain it is wholly given it is wholly given and not taken so love morality honor esteem dishonor these are all components of a created reality ye created reality hain ye aise shashvat satya nahi inko banaya gaya hai ye mind ke through banaya gaya hai honor esteem dishonor ye sab reality jisko hum log maan ke chalte hain kya kahenge log duniya ka sabse bada rog kyunki ye jante hain sigmund freud ne kaha hai ki ye created reality honor and dishonor ab ab aurte hain us samay jo shaadi kar leti thi punarvivah kar leti thi remarriage kar leti thi after the demise of her husband unko immoral bolte the abhi theek bolte hain waqt ke hisab se change kar raha hai this is where we have to understand it now what then is the difference between the dream and the neurosis in one hand and art on the other so the here thrilling writes and he is quoting sigmund freud that the poet dreams being awake poets jo hote hain wo sapne jagte hue dekhte hain bhai his subject does not possess him but he has dominion over it and the poet is in command of his fantasy the neurotic has very little command over it neurotic to koi command mein rakhta hi nahi hai wo to without boundary hai aimless hai scattered hai but artist uh, the poet wo apne fantasy ko apne command mein rakhta hai and the artist is not like the neurotic he knows a way back from his fantasy neurotic cannot come back from his fantasy he always dwells in fantasy but an artist knows how to, when to go and when to come back so art has a therapeutic function in releasing mental tension and it promotes the social sharing of highly valued emotional experience 
So, art has a therapeutic function in releasing mental tension and it promotes the social sharing of highly valued emotional experience. It recalls men to their cultural ideals. So uh, this part two ends and now begins the part three. And in part three, as I have already told you, that this part three is dedicated to the utility and relevance of his psychoanalytic technique for the study of art, particularly literature. Trilling then asks to quote, what then does Freud believe that the analytical method can do, especially in literature? Now friends, I would like to tell you that Freud has no desire to encroach upon the autonomy of the artist. The psychiatrist cannot yield to the author. The author cannot yield to psychiatrist. Layman may expect too much from psychoanalysis. <laughs> this expectation is always high upon psychoanalysis. But it must be remembered that it does not throw light on the two problems that bother him most. It cannot do it can do nothing towards elucidating the artistic gift. It cannot explain the way in which the artist works. So analytical method, if they cannot do that much things, what it can do? Analytical method can do two things. First, explain the inner meanings of the work of art. And second, explain the temperament of the artist as a man. My God, these two things is quite, are quite important. The first analytical method can do is to explain the inner meanings of the work at art. And second, explain the temperament of the artist as a man. Now, famous example of this is the method is to solve the problem of Hamlet, which is written by one of the greatest tragedies written by William Shakespeare. And as suggested by Fred, and as carried out by Dr. Ernst Jones. The research undertakes not only the clearing up of the mystery of Hamlet's character, but also the discovery of the clue to much of the deeper workings of Shakespeare's mind. And Frad tried to see the Oedipus motive in Hamlet, that is postponement. As you know, the very story of Hamlet, that Hamlet's father, the king, was murdered by his uncle Claudius. Knowing even this, Hamlet took much of his time to assassinate his uncle. And why was this postponement? What is the mystery behind it? And here Sigmund Freud says that perhaps Shakespeare's own life was much working behind it as Shakespeare was much attached to his mother because Hamlet in the drama, Hamlet's mother also got married to his uncle. So because of the mother fixation, perhaps Hamlet kept postponing the murder of his uncle. And where here comes the uh, utility of psychoanalysis that we do not study only the hidden meanings of of the uh, write-up, but we also go and delve into the personal life of the author. Now, we have no quarrel with the assumptions of Jones, but it must be remembered that there is no single meaning to any work of art. Changes in the historical mood and changes in the personal mood change the meaning of a work of art. It makes art as a richer thing. So the meaning of a work does not lie only or solely in the author's intention, right? It also does not lie in the effect of the work. The audience partly determines the value of a work and it comes into reader response theory, you know. So the mystery of Hamlet is not uniform. There are, if I read Hamlet, I can decipher mystery in my own ways, if we will read Hamlet and Hamlet goes into a hand, 
you will read this mystery based upon your own experiences of life. So this is where the Twilling says the mystery of Hamlet is not uniform. And moreover, the elements of art are not limited to art. They reach into life. To find out the mind of the artist is not at all practical. Jones' assumption that Hamlet is central to Shakespeare's character is purely subjective assessment. It may be the thinking of Jones at personal level, but it is cannot be said universal, right? So, and then Trilling agrees that the whole notion of rich ambiguity in literature, of the interplay between the apparent meaning and the latent, not hidden, latent meaning has been reinforced by the Fadian concepts. And this is where the utility is. And then there is this rich ambiguity in literature was brought by this Freudian psychoanalytical method. Now, here comes the part fourth, that is the concluding part, where we make an assessment of Freud's contributions on greatness. Number one, that f we see that for all mental systems, Trilling writes, that for all mental systems, Freudian psychology is the one which makes poetry indigenous to the very constitution of the mind. Our mind is in itself poetic, you know, because mind is having different, it's not any form or it is not governed by one rule. It is just like, you know, free flow. Now, second thing that we get is that the working of the unconscious mind is equivalent to poetry itself. Our unconscious minds work as a poetry itself. And that is why I'll take you back to the Wordsworthian which is not written in this chapter, of course, but perhaps you have read it. That is why I am trying to take you to the quotations of William Wordsworth, and he talks about poetry. That poetry is, an, is a powerful, is, is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, recollected in tranquility. This recollected in tranquility is nothing but the subconscious or the unconscious mind where the poetry resides. So. Uh, third, the fad showed how the mind in one part could work without logic. So the unconscious mind in its struggle recognizes no because, no therefore, no but. Mind does not know any because, if and but, therefore. So uh, mind has no Hegelian thesis, antithesis and synthesis. <laughs> this is without that if and but and so on therefore. So Freud puts forward a new idea in this connection and in his essay Beyond the Pleasure Principle, written in 1920. This concept beyond the pleasure principle, this supplements Aristotelian catharsis. It is very near to the Aristotle's notion of catharsis. That Freud's earlier theory was that all dreams could be understood as the effort to fulfill the dreamer's wishes. What we cannot fulfill in daytime, we fulfill in the nighttime in our dreams. Suppose you have beaten me and you are powerful. I cannot beat you in the daytime, so what will I do? In my dreams I will beat you up, I will kill you, I will murder you. <laughs> so the pleasure principle work in dreams, this is what was assumed. Fred reconsiders this view in Beyond the Pleasure Principle and he feels that in cases of war neurosis, shell shock, the patient recollects the experience with utmost anguish. There was no pleasure principle. Here no pleasure principle is involved. The dreams that come in the war victims, they were not governed, those dreams were not governed by the pleasure principle. So Fred says that in the psychic life there is a repetition Compulsion that goes beyond the pleasure principle. This traumatic, traumatic neurosis is an attempt to mithridatize. Mithridatize is a medical term for medical science where a patient is administered small doses of poison. 
ultimately the dose is increased and he becomes immune to poison. So this nightmare, the dream is, is that a person sees, is an attempt to overcome a bad situation. By repeating it, he is making a new effort to control it. If something bad is to happen, if you are in a trauma, we try to visualize the bad things in our dream so that if the situation comes in, in my real life, I'll be already prepared for that, to meet the situation. This is how we are so complex our mind is. It gets us ready for any situation. And here the Sigmund Freud is working. You know. In reading Freud, now what is the conclusion of this essay? So our reading concludes it and tries to convince us that one is always aware in reading Freud how little cynicism there is in his thought. His desire for man is only that he should be human. So Freud tried to make us human. Freud tried to make us, uh, you know, brought, bring us from being animals to being human. Because if we were not taught, talked about of our aid, we were not told about the aid, we could be animalistic. We could be always pleasure loving. So Freudian vision is not narrow, rather it is, it, it widens the, you know, uh, you know, platform of discussion and study. Thank you very much, friends.